Um, some of you might not know where Vanuatu is, so I'll just a little geography lesson. Um, you sort of got Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and then Vanuatu sort of like that. So it's sort of go up in a foot of, sort of 45 degree angle to the right from uh, New Zealand, South Pacific Islands. A bit closer to Australia, you've got uh, New Caledonia, and a bit on the other side of Vanuatu, you've got Fiji. So it's sort of tucked right in the middle of all those countries. Um, they're Melanesian people, like you have in, in Papua New Guinea, uh, and they're called Ni Vanuatuans, or just Ni Vans for short. Uh, the country was run by the British and the French jointly as a colony for many years uh, through the uh, 19th, uh, 20th century, actually, up until 1980 when it got independence and was then called Vanuatu. Before that, it was called the New Hebrides. Um, we've had a fellowship there for 20 years, and that started from an outreach in the city centre in Canberra. And um, some saints met uh, a man from Vanuatu who joined the Canberra Assembly, and within a couple of months, he wanted to go back and uh, preach the gospel in his own countries. And that's how it started in 2002. Uh, so there have been many rallies and outreaches over the years to Vanuatu, but of course with COVID, there's not been anything happening. And so uh, there hasn't been any, any visits from Australians there for about three and a half years. And so this rally that they've just had is the first one in quite some time. And it was more of a rally just to bring everyone together, consolidate, uh, training, more than an outreach. Uh, people came from all the islands by plane, by ferry. Some of them take a couple of days to get there by ferry to the capital city, Port Vila. And um, <clears throat> there was about 180 that came from all the different islands. Uh, we had, uh, there was a bunch of Australians, 12 of us that were over there. And most of them, well, they were all from the East Coast, except for me. It's a, it's a long way to go, you know, five hours to fly to Sydney before you even get on the plane with those guys. Um, but well worth it and uh, a lot of outreaching, with a lot of musical outreaching going on. There was a guy playing a trombone, he's Australians, right? Trombone, flute, violin, uh, clarinet, a couple of us strumming guitars, ukuleles, that sort of thing, making quite a noise in the park on the seafront or in the markets where they sell all the, the vegetables and fruit and so on, uh, coconuts and pineapples. And it's amazing how quickly a crowd gathers and they're just clapping along, they're singing the songs because it's a very religious country. I mean, it's been Christianized by missionaries and they all know the, the songs. And then you can talk to them or give them leaflets and you know, it's very fertile in that sense. Um, the rally was great. Uh, we had sort of training sessions. We had uh, heard testimonies, one lady from Tanner uh, had cancer of the womb and was healed, amazing testimony. Another young lady was, came from a, a very dysfunctional family where there was a lot of carver drinking going on and uh, had to go to a different house to be safe every night and came to the Lord, received the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, just had a, a new life, rejoicing. Another testimony I've heard of a baby that was blind, that was taken to the hospital, couldn't do anything and uh, the saints prayed and the baby was healed. Um, but it is, it is a very Christian country. You've got the biggest denomination is the Presbyterian Church because missionaries went there in the 19th century. Uh, the first two missionaries to go there were eaten by cannibals uh, in the about 1820 or something. They tried again. They, they spread the, um, the, you know, the message. And now there are many, many denominations there. You know, uh, just about every denomination you could think of is there. And on their flag, they have their, their motto is, Long God, you me stand up, which means in their language, sort of a pidgin English, with God we stand, and that's across their flag. But the trouble is they, they sort of have a half gospel. Well, either they have no infilling of the Holy Spirit or there are some in the church that do and some that don't, and we call that a half-half gospel, and you need the full gospel, as Curly said in his testimony. He received the full gospel. And uh, we find we were following up people in these little villages uh, surrounding the capital. Uh, people live in poverty, a lot of them. Uh, it's very, the, the ground is fertile, they can grow vegetables and, and things and support themselves. But there's trouble in the villages because a lot of the parents are coming to Australia for seasonal work. The kids are living with grandparents. 
They've got nothing to do. They start taking drugs, start stealing. Of course, there's the internet. There's all the outside world come pouring into this country now. And a lot of, we met uh, probably three chiefs. I mean, they're modern day chiefs. They just wear a t-shirt and shorts, but they're in charge of a village. But their authority is waning because of the outside influences. And a couple of them asked us to pray for their village, that there would be harmony and peace, that they're young people. So they need our help. They really do need our help to, to um, just to sort of support them, to help them keep on the track just as we all need each other, uh, to, to go on in, the, in our doctrine and our, our, our full gospel that we cherish. And in outreaching there and maintaining our separation. Um, so we're planning a trip. A trip is being planned, uh, just a tentative trip at the moment for July next year in a diff- on a different island, the island of Espiritu Santo, which means Holy Spirit, by the way, up at the top of the country. And there's a, a city there called Luganville, which was a big base during the Second World War. But a uh, very nice place, a very nice island, lots to do there. And it's... Uh, Plan to be a young people's outreach, bringing young people from around Vanuatu to Santo and young people from Australia during the July school holidays. So I'd recommend anyone who's got some holidays then to go and get involved. It really is um, just inspirational, life-changing, you know, just to, to be part of the work and see that the gospel is just the same as it is here and all the needs are just the same, the testimonies, what God is doing for people is just the same. Um, you've got brothers and sisters, we've, we've got different coloured skin, but we're all just the same. There's just the same banter, the same jokes and the same great fellowship. It's just wonderful. So leave it there and uh, recommend a trip to Vanuatu. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> there's actually, in 20 years, quite a lot of assemblies begun there. I think there's about nine assemblies on Tanner Island. Yeah. There's another two in Port Vila, the capital, and so on, right through the islands of Vanuatu now, which is wonderful. All right, well, look, without any further ado, Pastor Mike's got the word for this morning, so we'll just uh, hand the platform over to him. Thank you. Thanks, Pastor Kevin. <clears throat> All the water's disappeared. Let's open the Bible, shall we? Uh, I'm going to have a look at Mark chapter 10, please. Mark chapter 10. And the uh, theme today is um, children of God because I was thinking about our concept this afternoon and using that as a bit of um, uh, a metaphor for uh, our life in the Lord. Pastor Kevin mentioned you know, about being born again and about how our life is a joyful one. And, and these are the things I'm going to um, dwell on a bit today because um, it's at, at the end of the year we, we do tend to appreciate, you know, we've got camp coming up and appreciate what the Lord's done for us throughout the year and a wonderful fellowship uh, as we're coming to a close of one year and getting ready for the next year. Uh, it's, a, it's a good time of appreciation and and that's part of the communion meeting uh, on a Sunday morning is we're appreciating our relationship with God and with each other and, uh, and what the Word of God has said. So Mark chapter 10 here, we'll see in verse 13. And it says, And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for as such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, he put his hands upon them and blessed them. And so it's just a, a little statement Jesus made, one of those must statements we've got to pay attention to. He says we must receive the, the kingdom of God like a child. And uh, there are various things uh, that are, I... I envy children. You know, they have a, a simple approach to things. They, they are very happy. You're going to see a lot of giggling happen this afternoon and, and uh, excitement and, uh, you know, it, it's always fun, isn't it, seeing kids up there and can't sit still for excitement and all that sort of stuff. And, and remind me, if Pastor Kevin reminded us earlier, of, of what it was like when we got filled with spirit. There was a bit of a nervousness about getting baptised, a bit, bit of nervousness about is it real, isn't it real? And... Um, and then the, the, the great joy of discovering as we spoke in tongues 
the undeniable proof that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. There is a God, the Bible's true, and somehow we're right with God. This is not going to end, it's going to continue. And uh, what a revelation that was, what an exciting thing it was uh, to begin. And Jesus is talking about this aspect of being a child, not because he wants us to be you know, ignorant or, or, um, or, or sort of... Uh, uh, you know, debase our, our intellect or our education, put, put aside that, but because there is something important that he wants from us. And he expounds it in the other Gospels. We'll go to Matthew 18, just one of... It's mentioned in all the Gospels, but I just started there. And so, as I say, I want to uh, talk about being children of God because... Uh, we talk from an early age that God wants to be our Father, our Father which art in heaven. You know, we remember being taught that to say that, repeat that, although it wasn't meant to be uh, repeated. But that, that's a relationship with God. It's, it's not, um, uh, we're not worshipping the Creator, you know, in the Old Testament, or Jehovah, the, the, the one that uh, revealed himself to Israel, but uh, the Saviour, Jesus Christ. God wants to save us, wants to do us a favour. And here in Matthew 18, a similar uh, rapport with the disciples, he said the same came to Jesus, or sorry, at the same time came the disciples to Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, whosoever I say unto you, I verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so, and so just leave it there for a moment. So this aspect of a, of a child, Jesus is pointing out here, is that to be humility. A child uh, uh, aren't in a position to, to be arrogant or, or um, you know, proud or, or feel that, you know, that they have all the answers. They rely on mum and dad. You know, mum is the greatest mum in the world and dad is the hero, you know. Remember those good days before they became teenagers? Um, and, and it's like that. They're so dependent on their parents that that's the reason for their joy, their security. You know, in a good house, obviously, in a bad house, it's um, uh, the reason for their grief. But in a, in a good upbringing, they, they enjoy security and safety and joy, and as our children do. And we'll see them, uh, you know, excited this afternoon because life is good. And uh, the same as Jesus is promising here, if we can be humble, we'll save ourselves a lot of grief. Uh, we'll enable God to teach us a different way. And uh, we grow up thinking God thinks the way we think. God's ways are our ways, you know, and, and we look at religion around and sure enough, it's in many cases, it's just like a business, you know, God's business as it were. You know, you have a hierarchy of authority, it's like turning up for a job, you know, you, you spend your time trying to hang on to a job, don't you, in, in, a, in a company, uh, but it's, it's the people at the top, the management, the shareholders that are actually profiting from the business. It's not about you, you're just a temporary worker till you get the sack next week or laid off. But the business is all about the organisation. Well, we're going to see that the church is all about the individual, about you and about me and about the next person that, that wants to know about God. And so we see here that humility is a very important part of, of, um, of getting to know God. We, we can't get to know God if we want to be the boss. We want to tell him how to do his job. You know, it sounds a bit arrogant, doesn't it? Pride. But, but we get there through learning and, and endeavouring to understand. And uh, that's, you know, where, where we need to hear the gospel preached to us, to, to be explained, to uh, have our questions answered. And so he goes on to say in verse 5, Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. Uh, for whosoever shall offend one of these little ones who, which believe in me, it would be better for him that a millstone was hanged about his neck and, there, <laughs> and that he was drowned in the depths of the sea. It doesn't sound like a good option, does it? You know, a millstone is a huge stone they used to um, uh, have sit on the, another stone, grinding the wheat or the corn or whatever it was. You know, it weighed a lot, had a hole in the middle, to, so uh, a bit of a hub, a bit of an axle, and um, says, tie that round your neck and throw you in the sea and see how you go. And... Uh, 
you know, I don't know why he picked that as now, that uh, description, but it certainly gets the point across. You've got to be careful about, um, you know, what you believe and, and uh, what you receive and how you treat, um, you know, people of God. And he says, Why well, unto the world because of offences? For it need, must needs be that offences come. But woe unto that man by whom offences come. And there are difficulties, there's opposition, there's people with you know, different claims, a bit of persecution throughout the last 2,000 years. A lot of people, um, you know, they're not happy with what they hear or, or got other ideas. Um, and the Lord says that's the way it's going to be. You know, it's not going to be, um, uh, you know, better roses at work for, for his people. You don't have to overcome at the same time, not everybody's going to receive the, the word of God with joy. Now, why not? I don't know. They don't understand. I guess they're not humble. They don't want to learn. And so here we see in verse 8, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into the, the life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It'd be better for thee to enter into life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angel, or the messenger of God, do always behold the face of my Father which is uh, in heaven. And so fairly drastic uh, points Jesus comes across. He, he, he makes these points that he remember. What he's saying, you know, got to be like a child, not just humble, but like a child, right? You know, dependent on uh, a learning. A child, uh, in learning to a child is fun, right? You know, the child doesn't talk about work, right? I guess we talk about work, don't we? But to a child, every little activity is fun, you know, whether it's building a cubby, you know, it's hard work involved in building cubbies, I know, and or, um, you know, doing something difficult like Lego or something like that. You know, it's all fun. Uh, whereas as the older we get, the more cynical we get, the perhaps uh, um, the, the more um, hardened we get about advice and situations and, and the fun has just gone out of life. But if we be like a child, we be simple and we start from scratch, then um, we can grow in, in what God has to say. And we'll go to John chapter 3 just to point out that is what the Lord intends. John chapter 3, to start over, it sounds good. I mean, people just want to do it every year. People make a New Year's resolution. I'm going to do different this year. I'm going to, you know, get rid of that habit or give up that or, or do more of this. You know, I'm going to get fit and all that sort of stuff. And, and it's good intentions because they know that life has to improve. And Jesus is talking to a religious leader here, Nicodemus, in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi or Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. This man believed in Jesus. Right? He, he said he called him Master. He says, you're a miracle working worker. You are from God. And Jesus said to him, verily, verily, or most importantly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is explaining quite clearly that something has got to happen. And in verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And so he realised it wasn't a matter of changing your ways or, or um, you know, Living a better life, you know, you sometimes hear of born again cricketers or, or, you know, where they've come back to the sport or something. I can't understand what the term means really, but, but you hear it referred to people, it's got nothing to do with God. Um, but in this situation, Nicodemus understood this is a complete new start, like coming out of the womb, like a child being born. How does that happen to me, he saying? And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. 
And I, I didn't explain Matthew 18 very well, but when it talks about, you know, what you do with your hands, right, chop your hand off if it's, um, uh, you know, going to get in your trouble, or your foot, chop that off, or, or pull your eye out. And, and these are descriptions of, of life, where we go with our feet, where it takes us, what we do with our hands, what we, we participate in, and what we uh, uh, see, you know, where we, what we see is what we go after. And so, you know, we find ourselves... Uh, in a situation, as we do every day, with temptations and different things and views and that, we have to have some self-control. Just like we're reading there about being humble, you have to control yourself from being proud, right? You have to realise, you know, pride goes before a fall, you know, you, you know but you see it don't you, all the time. People think they're fantastic and, and they're not, you know, they don't have that, that ability to be fantastic all the time and, uh, you know, end up being disappointed. And so the Lord reminds us a bit of self-control is really important if you're going to be involved in the things of God. And Nicodemus here had to think again about how he'd been brought up, how, what he'd been taught, and realise there was something more. That's why he came to Jesus. He wanted to know what was missing in his life. There was something missing, something Jesus came to give. What is it? And this aspect of being born again of water and the Spirit, as Pastor mentioned, we come out of baptism, we bury that, we want a new life. And it says we're risen uh, like Christ, out of baptism, out of death, into a new life when we receive the Holy Spirit. Baptism is what we do, and uh, the Holy Spirit is what God does. And it says he fills with the Holy Spirit, it's a new life. And that's why we recommend it, because it happened to us, our lives changed, it was... Um, um, you know, a simple experience, you know, a peaceful experience, not, not lightning bolts or anything, but it was beginning, uh, just like a child. You have to begin somewhere, and it was begin with this birth. And it goes on to say in verse 8, the wind blows where it listers, and you hear the sound thereof, cannot tell whence it comes or whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And in the Greek, this sound is literally voice. You'll hear the voice, uh, utterance when you receive the Holy Spirit. So is everyone. And when you see that from the day of Pentecost, the start of the Christian church, with the disciples and Jesus' mother and his brethren there, uh, 3,120 people all received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Incredible, all of them. As it says, uh, it happens to all of us, everyone that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said, answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Right? How can this happen? How it's all going to happen? And that's where people jump in, you know, they forget to read this bit. They just go to John 3.16, we'll read that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus brought this about, this opportunity through his sacrifice. It wasn't available before Jesus died and rose from the dead. The disciples didn't have it. When, he walked, when they walked around him, they had to be converted. We read that. Unless you be converted, become as a child. And uh, so they, this was their conversion. In Acts chapter 2, we see in the beginning of the church there, described in, in the book of Acts, uh, they all received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Later, the Gentiles, quite a wonderful um, moment in history um, because the disciples... You know, it's a bit like the Jews and the Palestinians. That they didn't don't get on too well together, the Jews and Gentiles, the Romans, the Greeks. And for them to suddenly speak in tongues too, when Peter was doing a bit of explaining about Jesus and preaching there, said so Peter's surprise. These whole household of Romans, presumably, all spoke in tongues. Uh, that was enough to convince Peter that they were saved. They were saved. They heard him speak in tongues. That's all. They didn't know anything. All right? they, they'd been worshipping idols and different uh, gods to, to the Bible. They didn't know the Bible, but they received the Holy Spirit. Because it's a gift. You ask, you receive. You believe, you receive. Get convicted even and you receive. Um, at any place at any time, uh, as, as we can testify. And so this is the beginning of Christianity. Being born again, being a child of God, comes through receiving the Spirit of God. Just like we're a child of our parents, they conceived us, you know, they pass on their genes and, um, uh, you know, mannerisms and that. In fact, that, that's what binds us to our children, isn't it? You see a little bit of you in your children 
or your grandchildren in my case, uh, and it really makes them precious in your sight. You know, they're, they're a bit of you. And that's why the same with God. He gives us the Holy Spirit. We're a bit of him uh, from that moment on. And so we're going to look on, as I say, about the wonderful relationship we have as being a child of God. Sometimes we think we have to impress God. And Jesus says, no, the greatest among you will just be out like a humble child. Nothing really to brag about being a child, but uh, we'll see in the scriptures how that works. Let's go up to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, how in the natural we, we're used to organisations of, of authority and, uh, you know, starting at the bottom, working way up to the top. And it's a surprise to, to read in the Bible. It's completely different in, in the church. And we read about that here in chapter 1, in verse uh, 21, one of my favourite verses here. It says, now, he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. The person that filled you with the Holy Spirit, I, I didn't give it to you, I may have baptised you or prayed with you, but I didn't give it to you, or maybe you got it on your own, down the beach or praying in the shower or down the chook pen. You know, people receive, they think, I'll just have a pray. And they receive all over the place, the traffic lights once. I mean, you do hang around at the traffic lights a while, but that's pretty quick, isn't it, at the traffic lights. And he says, well, the person who's responsible for your walk in the Lord, for beginning, kick-starting your life, is God, who has sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. We've got the Holy Spirit. Uh, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Now, Paul's writing this big epistle here to Corinth because he's got a few faults he's trying to fix up, a bit of corrections. He says, look, I don't want to turn up and just tell you off all the time because the Corinthians had a lot to learn. And, uh, you know, they were mainly a Gentile church, you know, Romans, Greeks, so on, who didn't know the things of God and, uh, you know, were trying to do work, work a church in a worldly sense. But he says, oh, I'm, I'm not wanting to tell you off. I'm just wanting to teach you. And he says here, for um, not that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith you stand. But I determined that I myself, that I will come again to you, not, well, that's chapter 2, won't go there. So the point is, he says, look, my job, and, and Paul certainly is somebody to admire and somebody of, of, uh, accomplished a lot in his preaching and, and miracles and, and the things he went through, and certainly a bit of a hero uh, of faith, but he says, no, my attitude is I want your joy. To be full. I want you to rejoice. It says here, uh, your uh, verse 28. Moreover, call to God a record that despair came not to Corinth, not that we have dominion, that we don't control you, rule over you, your faith, but are helpers of your joy. And uh, this is the beginning of my, my point is that the person filled with the Holy Spirit and perhaps doesn't think they know anything and, uh, you know, the, the change in their life seems to be slow and, and oh, I remember that situation, although I'm not learning anything, everybody seems to know everything, I know nothing, you know, for, for months there. And, well, they're the most important person. You've got to hold on to them and succeed. It's like, you know, a child growing up in a good family, as I mentioned there, you've got uncles and aunts and grandparents and so on, everybody concerned about the well-being of that child, the newborn or whatever. Uh, they're very special. And some children grow up with that and they realise they're not that special and they feel a bit spoiled or they should be spoiled and that everybody's there just to serve them. Well, that's just for a few years until they can contribute something themselves. But, but the attitude is, well, yeah, they're vulnerable and, uh, you know, their, their well-being is somebody else's responsibility. It's our responsibility. And so that's how the church works. We'll go to another verse in 2 Corinthians. Oh, I went there, 2 Corinthians. We'll go to 1 Corinthians, back a bit further. Chapter 3. These things, I just want to appreciate, as I say. You know, the Lord talks about... Uh, individual being humble to get saved, to get the Holy Spirit, get baptised, it's a good start. But then again, it says you've got to continue being humble. 
converted and continue being a child, being humble. And, uh, and the church is that, as we see described here. In chapter 3, we we'll read in verse um, 22. We'll go down there. And uh, there's a bit of a bit of a problem in, in Corinth, as we see here, a few things need explaining that, that people have been baptised by Paul or have been baptised by a fellow called Apollos or even baptised by Peter, Cephas. And they're all saying, well, I'm a follower of Paul. And someone's saying, no, I'm a follower of Apollos and I'm a follower of Peter. And Paul had to point out the fact that, that in ourselves we're nothing. As he says, whether Paul, in verse 22, or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life and death or things present or things to come, all are yours. It's all for your benefit, as he says there. And you are Christ and Christ is God's. And it's just saying, yeah, we're all here. We're all doing something to help you or, or start your walk or explain things and encourage you. But he says, um, you, you don't serve us, we serve you, as he's saying. And down in chapter 4, again, in verse uh, two, 1, we'll read, and it says here, let uh, a man so account of us and so the minister of Christ and stewards and mystery of God Moreover, it is required of a steward that a man should be found faithful. That's what we're endeavouring to do, to be faithful to the teaching of Christ, to be faithful to what Jesus said and repeat what Jesus said so that the same results will happen as have happened throughout the last 2,000 years. And so going to warning here in verse 6, as I make the point, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up uh, for, a, or for one against another. For who makes thee to differ from one from another? And what hast thou that you did not receive? Now, if you did, uh, if you did receive it, why do you glory? as if you hadn't received it. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because we start off as a child, as it were, and the things God and admit we know nothing. And, you know, we put aside our religious ways and our arguments and our superstitions and think, okay, let's do it God's way. We get baptised and that feels good. You know, we've done what God said. You know, we feel we've accomplished something or on our way. We pray and maybe for a few minutes and suddenly we receive the Spirit. Or maybe we go home and pray. Or maybe next week, come along and have a pray because we don't quite understand it, not uh, perhaps a bit nervous, a bit fearful, what's going to happen. That's okay. And we gradually get to a point and suddenly we receive the Holy Spirit. And we think, this is great. But, you know, you've got a fellowship somewhere. You don't know anything. And the important thing is we're looking from the scriptures here. Most of the New Testament is all about how to have a good fellowship, how to have people who care about each other, who are going to be, you know, productive, going to, well, beneficial, I should say. And that's what we've got in all the people said. You know, it's just fantastic to see so many people voluntarily contribute to the well-being of saints and the Lord. It's all a voluntary. We, no one, as it were, is paid to come. No one is paid to, to produce uh, you know, what God's talking about here. It's all uh, voluntary. We, we do it because we want to. And as we see here in this scripture here, verse 6 onwards, and we'll read down verse, um, verse 9, for I think that God has set forth the apostles' last, as it were, appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle, unto the world, and to the angels, to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. You, we are weak, but you are strong. We are, um, you are honourable, but we are despised. And, the, and Paul is uh, talking about, you know, he serves to the church and, and to the Lord, and he's saying, you know, for other people's benefits, he's saying he does these things not for his own glory. And whereas he warns us here in verse 8, you are fool, you are rich, you reign as kings without us, and I would to God you did reign, but also reign with you. And so what had happened in the, the church of Corinth is worldly influences, the business interests, as it were, the corporate, you know, sort of feel to the church had taken over and, and people were running it, you know, and glorifying themselves. 
Uh, just as the world does, you know, you want to uh, be esteemed, you want to be promoted, you want to be valued, you want to, you know, take some pride in things. And, and this had ha- started happening in the church. And it's wrong. Because it says here, you know, what did you get? That wisdom, that understanding, that inspiration, that revelation, you know, to be used in the gifts or to help somebody or praise somebody, did it come from you? Or did you get it from the Holy Spirit? And we all got it from the Holy Spirit. You know, we see the Spirit work in our life every meeting, every time we come together, you know, whether it's to be used in the gifts of say or to share a word of encouragement or give a talk or all these things. You know, we rely on the Spirit and, and it surprises us sometimes, you know, how we find the answers, how we, we say the right thing. Uh, whether it's witnessing or encouraging one another. And the Lord's reminding us we all received it from God. Isn't that fantastic? It's not as if nothing's been happening in the time that you're growing in the Lord. You're getting that understanding that you never had before. You may have gone to church all your life and never understood some of the simple things that we appreciate now. And because the Spirit of God was it in your life. And so today as we appreciate, you know, how happy our children are, God wants us to be happy. He wants us to appreciate what he's got and, uh, and appreciate each other. Let's go to another scripture in 1 Corinthians, Galatians chapter 5. This again reflects on the wonderful change that's taken place in our lives as we became children of God. Galatians chapter 5. As Kim mentioned, we, we change and, um, from within. And uh, the old things we don't do, you know, I remember um, uh, I heard the gospel for a year. I didn't want to give up the life I was living. I thought I had too much to give up, so I didn't do anything about it. But eventually, out of curiosity, I went to a meeting, and that night I thought I'll give it a go. I'll have a pray and, and receive the Holy Spirit. And I got down and thinking to myself, well, I'm not going to pretend, so what is it all about? You know, a man being crucified, you know, how does that affect my life. How does that work? I'm just thinking that while I'm saying hallelujah because I didn't really know what to say and I spoke in tongues. I got my answer. That's what it's all about. And I had this joy, this peace that I hope wouldn't wear off, you know, as things do. You have a good time in the world. The next day you've got a hangover. No, I didn't have a hangover. I, I was fine and I was happy the next day and I found I didn't want to smoke. I didn't want to drink. had no interest in, in raging and that. And I just want to know more about what I had. I want to know more about, you know, what, what is causing this peace, this joy. I didn't have the answers for that yet. I needed to get along and hear a few uh, encouraging talks. And so as we, that's the, the life that we live now. It's just a wonderful change, a born-again experience and conversion. And in Chapter 5 here of Galatians, just want to talk about, you know, what, what we were like before and how we've been changed And, uh, you know, we want that change to keep going. And it says here, verse uh, 8, sorry, verse 14, sorry, verse 14, uh, for the law is fulfilled, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou should love thy neighbour as thyself. There's a lot of do's and don'ts, a lot of laws and how to get on together, how to benefit one another. And, you know, we can't even get on with their neighbour or maybe our family. You know, we're all going to get together with families and somebody will have a feud, you know, it ha- seems to happen, doesn't it? Somebody will fall out and you think, we can't even get on with people we, we know and love. Well, I'm not saying that, that me personally, but, but that happens in life, doesn't it? And the Lord's saying here, you can have all the laws about what you should be doing, but the goal is to get on with people, to, to treat people the way you want to be treated. And how do we do that? And moving down in verse 15, but if you bite, devour one another, take heed that you not be consumed one of another. Well, that sounds like terrible behaviour, doesn't it? But that, that may have been how you used to behave before. You know, get, get vengeance, right? Somebody do you wrong, well, they're going to pay for it, aren't they? Right? You get even or you get them before they get you. Well, these stupid sayings uh, um, come from it because, you know, people get their back up. And they're proud. They're not going to be walked over. And so somebody's going to pay for this. Uh, you know, all these sort of crazy sayings of how people behave, and it's through pride. As it goes on to say here in verse uh, uh, 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfil the lusts of flesh. Your life changes. It becomes like um, nature 
You know, everything in nature is guided by um, what do you call it, um, instinct, right? Animals just hibernate. Nobody tells them to. Nobody says, get ready, we're going to hibernate. They just do it or, or um, migrate, you know, from one side of the world to the other, just for a holiday, right? Go south, go north. You know, it's incredible, isn't it? Or uh, metaphor, me metamorphosis, you know? Caterpillars happy eating your, your lettuce leaves, or your cabbage leaves, and then the next thing it's in a cocoon and it's a butterfly. Incredible, isn't it? All these things just happen through instinct. Nature's controlled by instinct. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, there is this instinct, this spirit that kicks in and your behaviour changes and uh, your views change. As Pastor Kim testified earlier about his thinking and, and uh, his understanding, it all changed in line with God. And we see in chapter 5 here, now, the works, verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, and I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, everything that you read about in the paper and on the internet and jealousies, you know, jealousy seems innocent, but it turns into something worse, doesn't it? And uh, bitterness and malice. But it goes on to say in verse 22, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You can put up with things, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control. Against such there is no law. Just good things that just keep growing in our life. And as I say, we're appreciating the fact that our sins forgiven in a moment to the communion, appreciating you know, that we've had healings and blessings, but the greatest work is what God's doing inside us because that's going to go on forever. That's uh, preparing for Jesus' return. And so we're not only appreciating ourselves, but in the person sitting next to us, in front of us, behind us. And if you haven't got this in your life, then get baptised today. Discover it for yourself. And so we'll leave it there. We'll go to 1 Corinthians 13. We'll finish on this scripture. 1 Corinthians 13. And so as we read these verses, the Lord tells us several times there about, you know, to be a child, continue like a child, um, you know, he's telling us not to strive. He's telling us not to, you know, to let responsibilities or cares or, or um, situations get us down. To remain like children is just happy little Vegemites. Well, in Australia they are Vegemites. Um, but just happy, you know, and you see that in kids and you think they'll giggle and laugh about anything, right, won't they? You know, everything is just so exciting. I saw some kids come in the front there and they just stood in front of me and just burst into giggling. And I thought... I know I look strange, but, but you know, it, it's just happiness, you know. And um, people need a reason to be happy these days, don't they? I, I think of some of the stupid things, I shouldn't say that because um, I'll offend people, but, you know, we are entering the silly season. We're already well into it, aren't we? The silly season. Christmas is called the silly season, isn't it? Um, but people do things for no particular reason. I mean, they put lights all over the house, right? And I can understand Santa and some reindeers out in the front lawn, but, but, you know, there's a place next to us. I think the whole street stays awake all night because the lights are just like spotlights, right? They're going to be seen and everybody's going to stand and... And amazing at their house. Their power bill is going to be over the, through the roof. But, but you know, I think, well, why do they do that? You know, what is it about people? You know, or, or have Santa hats on their cars or reindeer antlers sticking out the windows. I mean, maybe you do that here. Fine. But, you know, I think, what is it about this? You know, it's not about Jesus or his birth. That's long been forgotten. And it never really was the reason for, for Christmas in the first place. It was a Roman feast that uh, the Catholic Church uh, converted to Christian uh, of Saturnalia, worshipping Saturn, you know, the planets. So, um, so, yeah, why do people do this? Because they do it because they need a reason to be happy. You know, it's the same with Halloween. 
I don't know why we adopted that thing from America, and nobody really knows what it's about anyway, but it's a good reason to get dressed up, you know, fancy dress on Halloween or something. And, and it's taken the world because it gives them a reason to be happy. Or well, grand finals, you know, you didn't kick the goal. It had nothing to do with you. You didn't mark the mark and do the handball. You did nothing. You sat on the sideline and ate your burger and fries or whatever it was. And, and yet, you know, it's like you won the day. It is grand finals, just full of celebration and an excuse for drinking, I suppose. And, um, and it just reminds me, in, in our life, as Pastor Warren brought out the other day, he was talking about, about being courageous, about being brave. Whoops, I shouldn't have got, told people to get ready for communion yet. Being brave. He just said we have the potential as human beings to do incredibly brave things. He talked about Horatio and anyway, that fellow he talked about. And, um, and, and if you've got a reason, you've got a good cause, people do it without the spirit, without faith in God. And we've got... You know, both, uh, for a good cause, preach the gospel. But also to be happy. As I say, people are looking for reason to be happy. We've got reason to be happy. And in this scripture, better read it, in verse 8, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. I'm not there yet. And that's the thing about children, aren't they? Very happy. Christ uh, never, sorry, charity never fails, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall be vanished away. Maybe you've spoken to a Jehovah's Witness and they've told you the tongues have ceased. And I used to say, so there's no knowledge anymore? Um, knowledge has passed away? No, this is when Jesus Christ returns. I know their prophecies have failed, but um, there's going to be a time when there's no more, you know, um, you know having little... Uh, um, understandings that the mysteries that lies ahead and, and what God, you know, prophesy, prophecies about the future and all that will be there. As it goes on to say in verse 9, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but then that which is perfect or complete comes, then that which is in part should be done away. When we're with the Lord, we won't be doing what we're doing now. It will be like him. We'll know him as he is and he will know us. And so it goes on to say, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part should be done away. And when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. And now abides faith, hope, charity, these three, but the grace of these is charity. And it was a good testimony of Sister Caris last week talking about her, her um, revelation about the love of God, about this charity, about, you know, our pur purpose in, in caring about others more than ourselves and our relationship with God. It's all, um, you know, a wonderful um, thing that's going to continue forever. And her revelation or understanding or grasping about, about this point is what enabled her to get a healing. She found that she, the, uh, she understood a wonderful truth in the Bible, this charity that uh, saw her set free from her problems. But it reminds us that it's going to pass one day. And, uh, you know, I think of my own childhood. I think I grew up too fast, right, didn't we? You know, we were so keen to become a teenager that we didn't really enjoy the freedom we had of being, you know, not worrying about bills and responsibilities and, you know, just making cubbies and, you know, th those fun games we used to play. We, you know, I would have liked my, my uh, childhood to last a little bit longer. You know, it was a good time. And, uh, and that's what I'm reminding myself here, that what we're doing is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be good. You know, we think of the gifts. We think of speaking in tongues. We think about knowledge and understanding and sharing the gospel with people. It's all fun. It's not work. It's fun. It's like I was saying earlier about kids. You give them a bucket of Lego and they'll spend all day building something, right? You know, we're making jigsaws or things that are hard, you know. It's like walking. You spend a whole year practising, don't you? You know, I've never seen a baby yet who just refused to walk and has to be carried everywhere. Eventually, we got it. And it's like that in the Lord. It's just, it's fun. 
And sometimes I find myself, you know, when I'm tired and maybe um, I've got some responsibilities and things, you know, cares of the world, as the Bible warns us about, I think, you know, it, it's hard work being in the Lord sometimes. You know, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And, uh, you know, and then I think, what am I thinking? You know, everything I do is fun. It's fun to get along to fellowship. It's fun to, you know, um, uh, share the gospel and see people receive the spirit and, and to hear the testimonies and, and that. You know, it's, um, it's good for me. I enjoy it. And, uh, and so never let the things of God become grievous in your life. It's, um, it's all to be enjoyed in all the people said. Amen. All right, we'll leave the scripture there. Thank you, brethren. I'm going to hand out the elements and I'll hand over to Pastor Simon. Thank you.